Hello and welcome to our study of spiritual formation. Uh, Dr. John Nisley is with us today and John teaches spiritual formation quite a bit. So welcome. Thank you. And uh, looking forward to picking your brain on this subject. Okay. Um, how long have you been at Weinbrenner Seminary? Been here 13 years. Time flies and we moved here in July of 2000 and it's been a good adventure. 13 years. 13 years. And where did you come from when you came to Finley? Previously, I had been in ministry in southeastern Pennsylvania in Lancaster County area for about 25 years. And before that, I had moved around a lot, but had served in the church for um, about 25 years as a pastor, also worked at a mission board, and also as a camp director. Oh, so quite a, quite a background. <laughs> yeah, and I think primarily what I had found over the years was the key element that people were looking for was how can I grow in my spiritual walk? And the emphasis of my ministry was really on discipleship. So how did you find an interest in spiritual formation? <laughs> Well, that's part of a whole life journey. It's sort of like, how do you uh, become who you are today? You know, whether you're a baseball player or a pastor or whatever. Start at a young age. And if you look at journey and looking at biblical stories as well as say bibliographies, uh, for me, sort of the beginning point of my spiritual journey began in a crisis at a young age. Uh, two years old, I, uh, I'm trying to get the exact date. We don't have it down, but supposedly I drowned in a milk cooler. I don't remember the incident, of course, and uh, they <clears throat> revived me, brought me back, and uh, that I developed pneumonia, and uh, my one lung was completely filled with water. This is back when you had milk cans in the milk cooler, not a large uh, bin where you put milk in. and. Um, they surmised that I was playing with the milk can lids as a kid and fell in in my uh, unsupervised condition. My two older siblings were supposed to be watching me while well, my dad and oldest brother were milking the cows. But uh, needless to say, what happened through all that, I became aware of God's protection and sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And as I reflect back on my whole childhood, uh, there wasn't a time where I didn't believe in Jesus didn't believe the Bible, and um, if I think of uh, discipleship and spiritual formation, I think of laying in my backyard as a child in the summertime <laughs> um, and looking up at the stars, you know, the lightning bugs are out and all of that, and just talking to God. And so I think I had sort of a intimate relationship with God prior to my baptism, we were in conversation. And so I look at spiritual formation as a relationship, a friendship, a conversation. And then at my baptism, I had one of those interesting occurrences uh, where uh, it can be dangerous talking to God. He may, he may answer. <laughs> well, at my baptism service, never forget, I asked the Lord, <clears throat> I said, why had our church stopped growing? I was raised in two church plants, and we would, our, our local church would go out and start new fellowships by basically buying other church uh, houses, meeting houses, that had closed and would open them up and send a group of people out there as sort of pioneer church planting families. And my father had done that twice. And that really impacted my life in terms of evangelism and discipleship, seeing those things connected, mm -hmm. and also then relating with uh, young children my own age through Sunday school class, clubs, and Sunday school, that sort of weekly encounter and friendship, going to school with them also, um, became aware of the importance of their own spiritual growth. and. Um, the whole thing of mutual discipleship and encouraging each other mm. in our spiritual growth. Because some of these kids came from uh, homes where they were, uh, say, struggling and had uh, a lot of issues. And it sort of developed a, I think, compassion in me for people that were coming from homes where young people that were struggling. Mm. 
that's sort of the launching yeah. part of that. Um, in terms of later on in my life, Rob, um, <clears throat> two things happened. One is I saw my friends who were pastors going through either burnout or I call it blow up. <laughs> mm -hmm. They were either frustrated in ministry or they were, uh, say, stressed out and just sort of overworked. And um, I was concerned about their, their health and their wholeness. Mm -hmm. And they were uh, leaving the ministry. That's one, uh, say, as an adult, got me into spiritual formation. The other piece was <clears throat> in terms of a class I took on church growth. At this time, I was working on a mission board and very interested in evangelism, discipleship, and how churches can grow and reach out. Today, we would call it being missional. Mm -hmm. Before that word was very popular. And what I found is that uh, we had lots of theories and techniques, we'll call it. And one of my instructors, Peter Wagner, answered a question in class. I asked him, I said, now we've looked at this material and I said, that's a lot to really understand. And I said, what's the bottom line? I said, why do churches grow? And he said, prayer. Hmm. And then uh, he said, would you like to know more? He's addressing this to the whole class. I asked the question. And I said, yes. And then he sort of changed it around. And um, his whole life now has gone this direction to understand spirituality, the importance of prayer, which is really take us again us into the New Testament and the book of Acts primarily mm -hmm. to see the dynamic of the Holy Spirit, spirituality, and how that relates to the church. That's a, I guess as short as the answers I can give no, at this that's, point. That's <laughs> good. It gets us rolling. Okay. There's probably a lot of folks that are not really familiar with the term spiritual formation. Sure. So could you maybe just give a, a brief overview about what you're talking about? Okay. Spiritual formation has become sort of a trendy thing in the last 20, 30 years. Um, some of the writers in our own lifetime, uh, Elton Trueblood was a uh, Quaker writer, and then Richard Foster, later on another Quaker writer. So the Quakers uh, who were evangelical were sort of the early pioneers using these concepts in helping evangelicals and Protestants understand spiritual formation, because spiritual formation tends to come out of historical uh, roots in the uh, Roman Catholic Church. And so that concept of spiritual formation really is something that goes right back into Scripture, back into the Old Testament. Um, in terms of spiritual formation, in terms of its definition, it's about our formation in Christ. That's how I define it. Uh, becoming more like Christ so that we, as we're following him as disciple, it's sort of like what happens to us on the journey mm -hmm. of being a disciple of Christ. And I didn't understand that growing up. <clears throat> I understood evangelism, I think, and the concept of discipleship. But what I found was in a lot of evangelical circles, books I've read, seminars, workshops, that kind of thing I attended, I found that oftentimes discipleship was more of a teaching focus. Like here, memorize these verses, fill in the blanks, do this lesson, and after a while it sort of seemed like a program or fill in the blank, and yet the process or the dynamic of this mm -hmm. wasn't really, say, enhancing the spiritual walk and the friendship of people with God. It was leaving sort of a void. Yeah, you mentioned about kind of a program and mm -hmm. um, learning things. You know, many churches have Sunday school, they have Bible sure. study, and this is kind of what we're used to. Mm -hmm. And yet what you're hinting at is that that can easily become one-dimensional and miss out mm -hmm. on some of the other dimensions. And mm -hmm. sometimes in uh, Sunday school, what I found is people would go from the text and jump right into application and sort of miss the middle part of, say, reflecting or digesting, or you might say meditating, or trying to do some deeper reflection on the meaning mm 
and the significance of the text. And what I found is that in terms of spiritual formation, when you come to scripture, there's uh, tools or methods <laughs> that have developed out of, uh, I'd say out of the Old Testament, uh, prophets and the way they looked at scripture that came into the Christian church, the early Christian church, and came through there. But some of that was left in the Reformation. And I think that's why we as evangelicals and Protestants, uh, when we left <clears throat> and reforming the church in the 1500s, we sort of left uh, some of that stuff which appeared to people to be uh, tradition or ritual and then started new and uh, tried to establish the primacy of the word or scripture. And I think that was important in terms of theology, to have our theology being accurate and sound but what happened is I think we lost the dimension uh, from the church tradition that had been gleaned through hundreds of years there from the time of Christ forward. We've lost that sense of the spirituality and the meaning uh, of scripture. We had the content, but maybe didn't have the, what I call the subjective or the personal application of it. In other words, we threw a lot of babies out with the bathwater <laughs> in the Reformation. That's a familiar cliche. And, uh, you know, we see that in different things in terms of how church, like an example would be like in architecture, uh, taking out musical instruments, taking out the paintings, the, uh, the sculptures, the statues, all these things. That became uh, sort of an austere kind of reaction to that. And it took... 500 years for us to come back and sort of recover what was a, I call it a biblical framework of spiritual formation. Yeah. And we'll be talking about that, I think, in the next session. The, sure. The, the, the way scripture comes in. Um, one of the things that I was reminded of as you were talking there mm -hmm. was that you spent several years as dean mm -hmm. at Weinbrenner. Sure. And as a spiritual formation person, mm -hmm. um, this uh, some of these forgotten dimensions have kind of worked their sure. way into Weinbrenner's DNA. Right. I think they typically refer to this as the knowing, being, and doing. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could maybe unpack the, the, the <laughs> difference between those. Sure. Well, that knowing, being, and doing has uh, a little bit of history to it. Okay. Part of it came out of my study in the New Testament, uh, specifically with Paul, and Paul's, we call trilogy. He has sort of like a three-leaf clover, faith, hope, and love. And I looked at faith as knowing with our mind. What do we know and in terms of theology? That's really important to us as evangelicals. So we have faith. And then the doing part, we're really good at doing stuff. I came from a church tradition that was very strong in terms of doing acts of service, uh, love, compassion, reaching out to the poor, as well as being very strong on biblical truth. Those two things. But what I have found is in my own tradition, as well as in most uh, Christian circles, I don't think it matters what, uh, say, faith uh, fellowship you're in, the being part is the most difficult. So the doing I connected to that second, uh, say, clover leaf there, in terms of <clears throat> the love. The love is, is the doing part of that. Love is expressed in action. And then the, the one that probably is, I call it the squishiest, squishy. <laughs> How's that for a word? It's a squishy word and it's more affective. And I connect that to hope. Faith, hope, and love. And I ask people, you know, what is your hope based on? Where well, a hope is based on faith, so faith, our theological foundation, is so important to spiritual formation, we can't ever leave that. But sort of like the house we build on that <clears throat> of love, of doing an action, then what's gonna be the atmosphere? What's gonna be happening to the relationships now that's inside that house, that's built on this foundation of faith, and you have the house of love inside there, the relationships is, and I think the dynamic of that is hope. And hope I connect to our affective uh, inspiration, our heart's desire. You can think of attitude, affect, uh, and spirituality. 
hope has more of a, if you want to say, mystical or affective or emotional or feeling dimension to it. And when we lack hope in our life, uh, we might say psychologically or emotionally that people can feel depressed or discouraged or disillusioned. So those three dimensions I had worked with for several decades in ministry, really building that as what I call my curriculum before I came to the seminary. And then when I came to the seminary, I found that they were looking for a design to build their curriculum on, especially in terms of assessment. We want uh, to determine what do students learn? What do they know? Okay, we can measure that. And then what do students do? And we can measure that. Can they preach? Can they teach? Can they counsel? Can they lead? Those things we can see, those are outward behaviors. But this last one, the being part or the hope, was the most difficult. And so there, that assessment, we still continue to work on it. How do you measure spiritual formation? That's one of, I say, one of the squishiest things to deal with because it's dealing with your relationship with God and it's one of the things that we don't measure that much with people in ministry. Um, we can see the absence of hope or spiritual formation or being. Um, and the being part of us, I think of it as in the Old Testament, it talks about our heart. It sort of was what is at the core and so what I found is, this is my it's a, uh, perspective, is that we can measure what we know in tests. Oh, you can take a multiple choice test, fill in the blank, you can write a paper, and that's objective. And then we can look at what you do. We can measure that in terms of how well do you preach and how many, uh, say, people have you led to Christ. We can measure uh, ministerial, you know, Christian behaviors. But then in terms of the hope, the being part, which is more affective, how do you measure that? So one of the things people have done is they looked at, well, how many hours do you pray a day or a week? <laughs> or, and again, it gets sort of behavioral because there's a, say, a qualitative dimension to this that uh, for some people, they look at, well, how often do I fast, do I pray? or whatever they uh, say use to determine their own spirituality. And part of it is uh, the fruit of the Spirit. It's sort of attitudinal. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, a dimension that we are still, I think, struggling with to uh, understand. And yet uh, I'm inclined to think that there's, a, there's a, an intuitive sense that mm -hmm. we have. I think of the people that have uh, strongly influenced me when I was a kid. There sure. were some people that were just head and shoulders above everybody else as far as the, the, the quality of person mm -hmm. that they were mm -hmm. and their, their level of care, their attentiveness to people, sure. their devoutness and their love for the Lord. Mm -hmm. um, is that the kind of thing that you're talking about? Yes, um, I remember one of my professors when I was in seminary, he said, um, your spirituality, he didn't, they didn't use the word spiritual formation back mm -hmm. then, where you could say your character. Sometimes we talk about that, the character of a leader. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like, what's the motive in your heart behind your behavior? Mm -hmm. So it's sometimes a more, uh, say, hidden, or it's more of a subterranean, it's in the basement, we can't always see it. <laughs> uh, Psalms talks about this, David <clears throat> in Psalm 51 talks about his heart needing to be cleansed and be refined because as Christ says, out of the heart comes the issues and behaviors of life. Mm -hmm. Now we don't start um, off being mature in this way. So you had mentioned True. the word process mm -hmm. and um, so I think often the word becoming is mm -hmm. coupled with the word being. Mm -hmm. and so there's this process of um, how we develop along this way. Could sure. you say a little bit about that mm -hmm. becoming process? Yeah. I have a, a phrase for that which is sort of paradoxical for you Rob. Okay. <laughs> I say that spiritual formation is becoming who we are. Mm -hmm. 
In other words, in our position in Christ, if you look at the book of Ephesians, in the first three chapters, Paul is talking about our position in Christ or our state as a Christian, that we're already in Christ. We are justified. Yes. And we are, in a sense, you can think about it, in the state we're in, we are sanctified and cleansed in Christ. But then if you go to the last three chapters of Ephesians, Paul's now talking about our walk in Christ or the journey or the mm -hmm. process. It talks about things like putting off the old. You can think of that as old clothes mm -hmm. <laughs> or dirty clothes. You're putting off the old and then putting on the new. And that is part of that process. And that is a lifelong journey and process. And uh, in my dissertation, I developed a whole, say, um, it became autobiographical for me to look at that through six phases of how we become more like Christ and we move from, say, a performance-based relationship with God and ministry to one that's more relational-based. And it's sort of a transition in formation that we move from trying to please others and always trying to be perfect, that our perfection or our holiness is in Christ, and then we live that out, and it helps us, I believe, to become uh, more patient with others with ourselves mm -hmm. <laughs> and have more of a, we talked about a quality, have more of a quality of patience and peace and compassion with people and mercy. Um, and one of the local, you know, as I say local, one of the, um, say, contemporary people in our last uh, century, Mother Teresa, mm -hmm. was a great example of that and we see that in uh, you know, Albert Schweitzer, other people throughout history, where they had this quality of compassion and mercy for people. And then people ask, well, you know, how can you serve the poor? How can you do this? And, or I ask people like, why are you still in ministry? And so there's a, there's a reason for the hope that we have in us, as Paul says, it's based on the resurrection. That's the resurrected life in Christ but that, that has a way of impacting our daily walk that's not just a future hope, it's a present reality. Yes. And that's one of the theological uh, pieces that sometimes our hope, we think of, my hope is in the future that Christ is gonna return, I'll go to heaven. Yes, that's all true, but in a sense, in spiritual formation, heaven in our Christian life, walking in the resurrection, the resurrection, power and life reality is right now. Mm -hmm. And we see that in the New Testament. You talked about process. The, the, one of the primary examples would be Peter and the transformation of, from him to being sometimes impetuous, <laughs> okay, impulsive. Mm -hmm. And God uses that strong personality and drive to become a great leader in the church and changes that, transforms that into someone then who has this great compassion and leadership in the church. And you see the same thing in Paul, moving from persecuting the church to them being passionate for it. You mentioned about uh, this process. Mm -hmm. um, I'm inclined to think that as a Christian, mm -hmm. Again, like you said, it's not just about waiting for Christ to return mm -hmm. and do whatever we do in the meantime. Sure. Jesus calls us to follow him and it mm -hmm. involves really the whole of our lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, you had mentioned discipleship earlier. Mm -hmm. Could you um, maybe talk about the interplay between mm -hmm. being a disciple and being involved in spiritual formation? Sure. What I found in my own journey in discipleship <clears throat> that I had uh, wonderful Sunday school teachers, a good, you know, for as a young adult, you know, youth, uh, club program in our church that really impacted my life and taught me about reaching out to others, that kind of thing, um, good preaching and worship. So I was getting content and theological understandings. The, the <laughs> we call it doctrine then. The biblical doctrine book I had to study was this thick. 
it was over an inch thick. <laughs> and uh, we had to study that for our membership class in the church for baptism. That was a lot of history and theology. They call it biblical doctrine. And doctrine was our way as a church, as a faith community, understanding the scripture and teaching. The discipleship in that sense there was giving me the content or the faith component. And then the doing part of it there as a disciple, that was being modeled in the church and uh, also being invited as a young person to be involved in leadership in different areas in the church. That was helping with the doing. The being part was the component that I found uh, I needed more uh, nurture and more help in. Now my parents being raised in a Christian family, I tend to think of it that the, I call it socialization or the, the, the concept of being Christ-like was modeled and it's sort of like the environment around there it was not taught as much as it was caught mm -hmm. now we had family devotional life and theological discussions of course but the the element of spiritual formation this journey and becoming more like christ that was the element there sometimes we call it mentoring mm -hmm. in today's world or someone who's going to be discipling you, or even today we talk about even coaching, using different uh, verbs to help us understand this process. So for my own uh, journey, what I found was that I needed to have other uh, people in my life to speak into my life to help me to grow and to uh, continue that journey. So having uh, some mentors coming into my life, that began to impact my life as a young adult. But a lot of that happened when I was in college and then later on in seminary and working in a camping ministry too. But what I found is along that journey, I was one of many people that were feeling the same sort of missing component that was not there in terms of the journey or the process who do we have to sit down, like you and I are here talking about mm -hmm. this topic, but to have someone to sit down with and we can talk about our struggles, mm -hmm. that we can talk with about our concerns or um, just having someone to pray with and pray for us. Um, so today I have several, spirit, I call them spiritual friends or buddies <laughs> that I have found uh, to be a helpful thing. I'm also involved in our church in coaching. So uh, being coached and also coaching others. So I think the process is that we need people to speak into our life mm -hmm. and to encourage us. This is that hope element, which is the being part, and to process and dialogue with because in terms of this relationship with God, uh, we listen to God, but we also need uh, flesh and blood, people, <laughs> to speak into our life and to have this dialogue. You want to call it a holy dialogue. But those are things that we're missing sometimes the intimacy or the trust to have those kinds of mentoring relationships to help us in our journey. It's very helpful to see that, that process modeled before us. I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's one definition in particular that okay. uh, I think you've used in your classes that I've come across as well, Robert Mulholland's right. definition. Do you remember it off the top of your head? <laughs> I think it's something like the process of being conformed to the image of Christ, the image of Christ for, the sake, for, of for the sake of others. The bottom of page 12. <laughs> <laughs> you probably have it underlined. Um, Mulholland uh, was a uh, theologian who taught at uh, Asbury Seminary. And as a theologian, uh, that would be influenced what we call the holiness movement, which would be very familiar to us from the Churches of God perspective. And he looked at spiritual formation with sort of fresh eyes, um, I think from his own personal standpoint, 
and also as a theologian. And if you read definitions of spiritual formation, sometimes it can come off a little bit as self-help or trying to uh, sort of just increase our own spirituality or uh, spiritual muscles, where you want to metaphor you want to use. But I think he brought uh, a fairly holistic definition to uh, spiritual formation that's the process. So it's not just an event. And I think for uh, evangelicals, we tend to be a bit event-oriented mm -hmm. in our spirituality. We think of conversion, or we think of baptism, or we think of being uh, commissioned or ordained, or we say yes to a church office or some kind of service uh, project, or going on a short-term mission trip, or saying yes to being called as a missionary. Whatever the call is in your life, we tend to think of it more in a event. And sometimes those events, because of our background historically in the holiness tradition, can be a bit of a crisis encounter. Well, how much crisis do you and I want in our life? <laughs> what more crisis, Ron? No, thank you. No, thanks? Well, I think that's how many people that are, in a sense, sane, and <laughs> in the pews are sitting, listening to this and saying, do I want to have more crisis and stress in my life? Mm -hmm. And um, so the idea that Mahalam is bringing is that it's, it's a process and you maybe could almost put in there a adjective and say, God is at work in a very patient, gentle, kind and loving way to call us and to conform us to the image of his son. And his son is revealing to us the model. Here's the prototype of what it means to be uh, a person in God's family. His, you know, Christ is the DNA. We're the one to look at him as the model. He's the prototype to be like him. So it's a gentle process there, and <clears throat> this idea of being again conformed to the image of Christ, that's where uh, we can think of it as uh, you know, the, the clay on the potter's wheel being shaped, mm -hmm. or if you work with wood. Do you work with wood or clay, Rob? Um, more wood than clay. More wood than clay? I didn't know if you're a mechanic, you work with metal or not. <laughs> <laughs> but if you think of clay, it seems so sort of general, you're sort of shaping it. Mm -hmm. But woodworking, you get a little sandpaper, or a file or a rasp. Well, at different junctures in our life, God seems to use different tools in us. Sometimes he's using sandpaper, sometimes he's using a file. And you know, of course, what a rasp is. That takes off larger chunks of wood yes. at a time. <laughs> well, sometimes God is rasping us. And some of the people that we meet in scripture, like Job, have gone through a lot of this conforming process through some trauma and crisis in their life. So God is working in life. Job has a life, he's going along, very successful person. Everything is just full of blessing. He meets a crisis in his life, not because of sin, but because of how God is working in his life. And I think that becomes a change or a shift in our definitions here with Muhalland. Mulholland's coming from a holiness background, and that whole movement, which today looks a lot like the evangelical church, we can get into uh, what is what we call sin management as program. Mm -hmm. And a lot of churches can do this, where we go through conversion, then we work at confession, then we go on to try and continue the journey. Well, spiritual formation from Phoebe Palmer, one of the founders and workers in the holiness movement in Mulholland uh, along later, looking at this saying that this emphasis on formation is not just about sin management. Mm -hmm. If we can think about, we've gone to the cross, we've laid our sins, our baggage down. If we have a backpack, we just sort of simply lay it down there at the cross. But now we're gonna continue the journey, sort of like the story, the novel, you know, Pilgrim's Progress. Now we continue to, along the journey, and at each sort of intersection in our lives, just like Pilgrim, <laughs> we then face a different test or pruning where God is 
sort of helping us become aware of what's in our own deep heart. And that's probably part of the, the if you want to say, the, the mysterious part of it, that as believers, we are new creatures in Christ, but we still have a memory and behavior and patterns of time of what we were pre-Christ, before we came to Christ. And so an example today in our culture, a lot of folks are struggling with addictions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll just share one. This is one I see a lot I'm concerned about, and uh, it might be even humorous to you and our audience, and that is um, cell phones and texting while driving. Mm -hmm. I ask myself, why would someone drive, which is sort of a full-time activity when you think about driving a car mm -hmm. down the highway, and yet they'll be listening to a phone or holding their um, <clears throat> little iPhone, smartphone, whatever it is, down there texting so people can't, suppose they can't see them because it's illegal to do that. That's just uh, one metaphor I'll use to say for, in our culture, for addictive behavior. In other words, we can have a law just like we did in the Old Testament. We can make this the 11th commandment for Moses. Thou shalt not text while driving. <laughs> if Moses was alive today, God would say the 11th commandment is thou shalt not text or use cell phone while driving. And yet we know that people will do that. And we can see it every day. That has to do not so much with lack of enforcement from police, but it's the thing of our heart, attitude. Why do I need to do, asking ourselves, why do I need to be connected to people while I'm engaged in driving? And, um, I'll, I'll take now another metaphor in terms of formation to ministry. One of my uh, things, I'm, two prongs that got me into spiritual formation was seeing my closest friends get in ministry be angry or burned out mm -hmm. and leaving the ministry. And I use the um, sort of the um, metaphor or the cliche that they went from ministry back to selling Hondas. There's nothing wrong with selling Hondas, mm -hmm. right? But the idea is, if we were called to ministry, when did that call change? And too many people are leaving ministry within three to five years of their first, say, uh, experience in full-time ministry, even could be bivocational, and they go through some struggles, they go through some conflicts, some crisis, whatever, and their response to that is saying, oh, maybe I'm not fit, maybe I'm not called, Maybe, I've, maybe they feel like a failure or they get frustrated. And my point is that to maintain a level of hope in their life, remember this faith, hope, and love piece, <laughs> to maintain the faith, hope, and love level in their life to be uh, active in ministry, continue answering that call, has to do, I believe, more with their formation which is the being component or the hope component, I don't think there's a lack of theology and I don't think there's a lack of commitment to doing. I don't think it's because they are ineffective in their, say, ministerial skills, what they can do or what they know theologically. I think it is in the being or the heart or the formational component. Uh, and one of the ways I, I access this, <clears throat> I know it's very difficult to assess spiritual formation. Because basically people will respond to, you can open up a questionnaire and respond back and they can check off there what their formation is. And the key element I have found is that the X factor in spiritual formation as well as in ministry and leadership and a lot of dimensions of life, especially in our modern culture, is time. And do we have time for people and do we have time for God? And so one of the ways I started asking my friends who were in ministry, I said, could we meet for lunch or breakfast? And they said, uh, no, John, I'm booked up. And they would pull out their day timer. And I can remember yet those pages, they would look ahead and this month is filled and next month is filled. And I thought, if, we're, if our life is that full, where have you built in the margin for God, your family, mm -hmm. <clears throat> for say the church member who has a crisis? Mm 
who maybe wants to meet you for breakfast and talk over some struggle he's having at work. It could be you know, a financial issue, it could be um, that they're concerned about getting laid off at their work, whatever is the issue. Do you have time for people if your time schedule, your, your, your day timer, your calendar, if it's so full that you don't have time to meet with a friend for lunch? And that I began to use, that's my favorite, I call it the dipstick on spiritual formation is show me your <clears throat> day timer and that will tell me a lot about your formation. We used to say <clears throat> years ago, show me your checkbook and that will tell me your commitment, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of tithing and giving and what you give to and what you spend your money on. Well, if you have a time checkbook, <laughs> and what do you invest your time in? What do you uh, have as priorities? Which comes out of the, the whole element of values and heart, which is the motive behind that. Do I have time for my family? Do I have time for God? And do I have time for ministry? And I think those elements are very crucial in terms of formation and um, can I throw a Greek word in here? You sure can. <laughs> as long as I don't know it's a, I'm sorry? <laughs> as long as it's translated. <laughs> if we have a Greek audience or not. But one, a Greek word, and uh, sometimes these words, you know, just like uh, gyros or euros, we have that mm -hmm. in our, in our uh, menu. I'll just throw a Greek word into our, into our menu <laughs> here on formation. It's kairos. Most of us are familiar with clocks and watches. And... Do I make you nervous, Rob? I don't have a watch on. Oh, no, I've been okay. going all day. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, I stopped wearing a watch many years ago when I began uh, my ministry as a camp director. I found that <clears throat> people who um, follow the watch and the clock so... Um, say stringently, so in much of a disciplined way, uh, lack flexibility. And in, in camp life, you have to be very flexible. Ministry, flexibility is important. Yeah. Flexibility with spirit, key thing. So <clears throat> when we measure time, we use a Greek word called chronos or chronology. Chronological, it's part of our dictionary. Yeah. Well, a word in Webster's dictionary is missing. The other, that word is from the Greek, it's kairos, which means the opportune or right time. And it's sort of God's timing in terms of being open and being available. And um, I call it more how Jesus dealt with time and dealt with people in that he had priority on ministering to a few, his disciples, mm -hmm. ministering to the, with the Father in prayer alone, and also to the crowds. He had a order in his life, and when he felt the pressures, now, if Jesus feels pressures and needs a break, and needs to go out of the desert to pray and be alone with the Father, and to have rest, to have Sabbath, we also need to do that. So I think one of the dimensions which we miss from the Old Testament that is part of our spirituality and formation is the whole concept of Sabbath, which is our seventh day and if you look back in Genesis it says on the seventh day and think of this time period when God is creating everything which is a lot of stuff in the cosmos he rests because he says it's finished now we're to live in this seventh day we're living in this seventh day of, of Sabbath rest and when we take a, one day a week to set aside to stop that's what Sabbath means you know, the, the Hebrew word is Shabbat, but here we have it now in our English uh, language as Sabbath. What that means is to stop so we can rest. And that is a very important element in spiritual formation is to be able to stop one day a week. And then uh, I do personally, I just came off of this. Uh, this is why I have the suntan here. I, I take... <clears throat> um, and it's my daily routine of having a daily Sabbath, a weekly Sabbath, and then uh, a monthly Sabbath. I spend one day or two in a prayer retreat, 
and then one um, annual Sabbath, which I just came off of, I take a week and go off and unplug and live in a tent and go on a bike trip. I know this is interesting, tying cycling into spirituality, but spending time in creation. So I was down in the mountains of Virginia for a week out there riding bike with uh, another bike, with a bike tour, but I could spend a lot of time ref reflecting and praying, yeah. riding along, and I had a book along uh, by St. John of the Cross to understand the dark night of the soul. And that was a really spiritual uh, high and encouragement for me to have time set aside. That basically it was a week set aside just for God and I to commune and to be together, sort of camping out. And I have already taken my wife along uh, on that week and she thought one time was enough. <laughs> but we're going in July for four days, my wife and I. And I find some way we need to have Sabbath, and we talk about recreation or recreation. We need to have some way a structure in our lives to stop. And what I find is that in uh, our recreational life, an example, what we do in our culture is we go out and we're busier. Do you ever hear the thing, people come back from vacation and they're wore out? Mm -hmm. My goal is when I come home from vacation, uh, after my uh, week of, of cycling and being with God, I want to be more energized and refreshed than when I left. And that's true, even though I was doing a lot of mountain climbing mm. <laughs> in the bike. But that's my, that's my uh, own ritual because, and I don't do this as a legalism for others. I'm doing this for me because I know that I need it to slow down because uh, some people have called me a driven person, Rob. Can you imagine that? Mm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I found that to slow me down, because I talked about this for others, but something I also need yes. to do. In other words, I need to practice what I preach and teach in formation. Um, so that's an element of time as, is a crucial element because in formation, if we do not have time for God, and going back to Mahalan's definition, if we don't have time for God, how is he going to conform us and talk how can we talk to him about what he's doing in the testing, the sanding, the rasping of our yes. life in that formation process? And then <clears throat> to look at it, it's for the sake of others. So it's that time factor of being, uh, say, prepared and equipped by God to be ready for service uh, in his kingdom. As you were <clears throat> describing the um, the, the time aspect mm -hmm. as well, kind of the time checkbook. Mm -hmm. um, I, I understand um, that being able to look back at how we've used our time, how mm -hmm. we've used our money, kind of reflects sure. what we really believe, how we really sure. are. And you can see those transactions or investments right. as footsteps that, that really walk what we what we believe and we may say we we're a generous person but if our checkbook doesn't demonstrate that generosity then we're kind of deceiving ourselves and mm -hmm. and as you said our time is even more precious commodity now than than money for a lot of right. folks and and it says a lot about who we are how we spend our time or invest our time and um it struck me that that goes right mm -hmm. back to that definition mm -hmm. um, of the process of being conformed mm -hmm. to the likeness mm -hmm. of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. One thing that we see very often repeated in the Gospels mm -hmm. in Jesus' life is that he specifically took those times to be away. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't just crank out ministry all the time. <laughs> he, he spent that time with the Father. He went into mm -hmm. to solitude as a way of, mm -hmm. um, well, being formed mm -hmm. himself. Could you talk a little bit about um, Jesus and how he's a, a very good example of what you're talking about? He's the example. <laughs> not, not a bad example. <laughs> well, 
sometimes when we think of spiritual formation, we think of now we're going to become a bunch of monks, okay? <laughs> and uh, when you think of that's one early example of the monastic movement. Yeah. And the monastic movement is coming out of the apostolic church. But to go back to Jesus as the model of what they simply are living out a life that is sort of replicating or reproducing what Jesus modeled. So Jesus, now this is interesting for us <clears throat> to think about in our culture. Uh, he didn't have much of an organization, okay? <laughs> a website. <laughs> he didn't have a website. He didn't, he didn't have a, um, <clears throat> any kind of headquarters. It was all, in a sense, localized in him. And so it, it becomes a different kind of model for us in terms of spiritual formation and starting a movement. Mm -hmm. So it, sometimes people have looked at it and said that Christianity is a movement that's based on the person of Christ, mm -hmm. his ministry, <clears throat> and his life. And if you think of those, those elements, the person of Christ, his life, how he lived, and his ministry, in that Christianity is a movement. It's not a organization, it's more of a movement. We could say it's a spiritual community or a spiritual organism. It's, it's, it's a living, uh, breathing entity. And uh, the local church, in a sense, is part of that movement. It can be part of that movement. But in terms of Jesus there as the person being the model for us in formation, you see it as a young uh, boy, then he is submissive to his parents. But at age 12, he's going through his, say, initiation there <clears throat> for the uh, Jewish community he was raised in. And so he's submissive to them, but he's also in theological dialogue with people a lot older than him. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you see his theological awareness is coming early on there in the temple, having discussion. Uh, and then also being in dialogue and submissive to his parents. So as he gets into adulthood then, we call those years the quiet years. From 12 to 30, we don't know much about Jesus. Other than in those 18 years, he is there working in the home, in the family business. This is really interesting in his, you think about formation. <laughs> his being, uh, submissive to the demands and the responsibilities around him. But what happens, he answers the call of the Spirit at age 30, which is really interesting. They're following that biblical pattern from the Old Testament to respond to the call to go serve God full time at 30. <clears throat> and so what Jesus does, he's led by the Spirit into the desert for a time of testing for 40 days. I think there we get uh, a picture of sort of, I call it the nucleus of, um, of spiritual formation. There is that sense of solitude, he finds a quiet place. Well, he's led by the Spirit to the quiet place in the desert. Now, Nazareth is not New York City, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Nazareth is this little outpost on the edge of civilization. And uh, you could think of little towns um, where you may go deer hunting or something, you go to the end or on a trip someplace, and you get to like to the, when, the, when the paved road ends, <laughs> is where you know, the gravel starts, that's sort of like Nazareth. We're, that's, that, that's gravel road kind of stuff. And so his called even further out. Hmm. Well, that model of being called out, even from the edge of civilization, to go out into the desert, which is following an Old Testament prophetic pattern, <clears throat> then to listen and to be in dialogue with God. This follows Moses and the burning bush. You just see all these historical patterns. Then Jesus is there for 40 days, and what he's involved with is spiritual warfare. He's being tested on his heart motives. Mm -hmm. And theologians today still struggle with, and they say, why did Jesus have to go through that testing? If he's the Son of God, he has no sin, he has no sin nature, he doesn't sin, he doesn't do the wrong thing. Why is he tested? Well, it talks about in scripture, Jesus to understand us and what's like to be a human. 
He's fully human and fully God. So here's God experiencing in the flesh the human experience. That's the mystery of Christianity, okay? <laughs> this is God incarnate. He's experiencing our struggles and He's with us and for us and He's experiencing these struggles and now that he comes victorious, and the key thing that you find there that helps him through that is he's fully reliant upon the Spirit and the Word. Mm -hmm. He answers the test <clears throat> of the evil one there, the tempter, by always responding, thus saith the Word. That's the response. He relies upon the Word as objective truth and its power and its authority to have victory over the evil one, and the evil one leaves him. The spiritual sustaining strength he had there in that being quiet, being uh, in dialogue with God, and dependent upon the Word provides the core, I believe, for any type of spiritual formation model or method that you want to use, and then out of that came sort of my uh, design or model of spiritual formation that it's prayer, the word, and spiritual direction. And the spiritual direction that Jesus had was directly <clears throat> from the Holy Spirit. For us, that spiritual direction through the Holy Spirit comes to us through other people. And so we need those three elements mm -hmm. in our life of the word, prayer, and spiritual direction and then we also then, in terms of, we talk about this in terms of time, to have the time to set aside to be in a quiet place, that's solitude, and then to quiet our hearts, that's the Sabbath part, the Sabbath rest, that's silence. And then the third component of that is to listen to God or to be contemplative, to listen to God. So. That, that, um image of Jesus in the, uh, being tempted, um, really, in the desert, mm -hmm. in, in light of us, kind of leads us back to the, the way Mulholland's definition mm -hmm. ends, mm -hmm. for the sake of others. It's, mm -hmm. it's easy to see that uh, Jesus was uh, really doing what he was doing on behalf of us. Mm -hmm. He was taking our place, and on one hand, um, was offering a life of, of obedience that, mm -hmm. in a way that I will never be that pure, I'll never mm -hmm. be able to offer that mm -hmm. on my behalf. But mm -hmm. thankfully in Christ, the Lord has offered it to the Father for me. But at the same time, it prepared him for his ministry and mm -hmm. of course for the, the time when he would die mm -hmm. on my behalf mm -hmm. and be raised to new life mm -hmm. for me. And um, so really all that Jesus did was for the sake of others. And mm -hmm. so um, maybe as a way of wrapping up this mm -hmm. first session here, uh, you could flesh that out a little bit, that the whole idea that our spiritual formation as well is for the sake of others and not just ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it goes back to what I had talked about earlier in terms of my inquiry and study to spiritual formation. I had some awareness of this, and this goes back enough decades that the word was not very popular. I had done some reading <clears throat> in uh, Elton Trueblood and others, and uh, Trueblood was raising the question, the life we prize. What is it that we want our life to be? And thinking about our character, and, and that whole issue of community, and in some fellowships, like the Quakers and others, they emphasize community. And community has that concept that there's something bigger than me out here that I need to be focused on. And in terms of the, the community of faith, the church, that I look back at my life, every time that God uh, spoken to my life in a dramatic way. It was really interesting. It was always in public worship. It was always in some kind of communal setting. And as I began to reflect upon that, that really started to uh, challenge me that I need to be also giving back. Mm 
to the people that have modeled and nurtured me in my journey. So it's sort of like paying back or paying forward what you have received in terms of a blessing to then be a blessing to others, which is sort of like the Abrahamic blessing, that we are blessed so we can be a blessing to others. Very good. I think um, we have a sense that that's the case, and yet a lot of folks feel like, you know, what do I <laughs> have to, to offer? Sure. And yet uh, I think part of the process of formation is the Lord is doing something in us mm -hmm. so that he is able then to do something through us as mm -hmm. well. Amen. Well, thank you for um, sharing your story a little bit and getting us started in this study. I look forward to picking your brain more okay. throughout this series, especially as we look into the scriptures. In okay. The next Thanks for being with us, John. You're welcome.